Lord, I'm going to need your help this morning. That is for real. I thank you, God, that eyes can see what only heart can receive. So, Lord, what we see and what we hear today, help us to receive the Holy Spirit. We love you. We are intensely in love with you, God. The fire in our souls is burning. It's burning. We thank you for these songs, Lord. What wonderful things. Thank you, God, for letting us express our love to you in song. In Jesus' name. inside of her heart crying out for a child and Eli was there the priest and he says what are you doing you drunk woman get up stand up what are you doing he says, and she goes I'm not drunk and she's weeping she says I'm not drunk like you suppose but from the depths of my heart I'm crying out to God and Eli says you have whatever you're asking from God Amen. now Eli was not the most together priest there ever was he had a couple kids who were goofy, and he kept just letting them go along and stuff like that. But he was the high priest that year. And when somebody is in a position of priesthood, God does stuff through them. I want you to know, just because, not, I think God does stuff in spite of us, yes. not because of us. Absolutely. I just think that. I think that God does stuff just, I think, now don't get me wrong, please, especially on the, on the internet and the YouTube. But I think God leaves stuff in our lives. So each one of us has something in our lives that keeps us humble. Amen. Amen. Otherwise, we'd be getting cocky and weirded out and goofed up and, and think we're, uh, you know, Moses or Elijah or something like some of those guys. I thank God there are things in my life that I cannot look at you and say, you're bad. I cannot look at you and say, get your act together, dude. God has me look at my I get a look in the mirror every day. And this is why God leaves it in our life. It's not because you smoked a joint this morning or you had a beer before you came to church. That is not the point. The point is, if you come to church, you're here at the behest of the Almighty God, and He wants to use you whatever state you are in. Uh oh. That's going to get some feedback. <laughs> It's true, otherwise, how else would we function? That's right. 
How else would any of us That's sense right. the anointing of God? How would any of us be led by the Holy Spirit? I'm not saying go out and smoke a joint and get drunk before you come to church. <laughs> Please don't get it wrong here. <laughs> but if you come today and your life isn't in as good a shape as you thought it should be, ask God what he wants to do through you today. It's not so much about you. It's not so much about you. It's about him and who he is and how wonderful he can be. How do you think I can say that? I'm the guy. I'm the guy with... Actually, I don't have any problems at all. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> can you imagine being a Samuel or a Daniel? Now, Samuel, none of his words fell to the ground. That guy had his act together. Daniel... I mean, what a guy. Joseph gets thrown in a pit and he, he just be as positive the whole time. Man, if, if that happened to some of us, we'd be griping and sucking our thumb and twirling our heads. Oh, you dribble, God. You know? On and on it goes. It's just ridiculous. So God, God has been moving people to pray. God has been moving people to pray. And I want you to know, like I said last week, sometimes it is physically almost impossible for you to press into God. Physically. It's hard. It's tough. It's almost torture. You cannot do it. It's just you gotta you gotta go get a cup of coffee or something. <laughs> I gotta go eat breakfast. I gotta go clean the shed. <clears throat> anyway, it's almost impossible. So God is causing us to realize we need to press through. Amen. Press through those things that say uh, I can only pray for, you know, you've been praying for 10 minutes all your life. <clears throat> Some of you, that's a long time, so let, let me back it off, about five minutes. Okay, you've been praying for five minutes most of your life. You've been doing that devotion, you know, the, up my utmost versus highest takes about seven and a half minutes. So I've been doing about seven and a half minutes for 25 years. <coughs> Am I so far off? Go on. So God tells us, all right, now that you've done your seven and a half minutes, why don't you go ahead and spend some time with me? And I'm not so much talking about you praying for other people at this point in time. I'm talking about you coming into the presence of God and you and he communing and fellowshipping together. And then you can go to your list and say, by the way, Lord. See what I'm saying? You don't just come in there and say, <clears throat> Lord, bless Tina, 10, and 20, Terry, Doug, Tom, Jeff, and Jim, and little Bob, and please, Lord, help my brother. Those are real people, by the way. I used to pray like that. Tina, 10, and 20, Terry, Doug, Tom, Jeff, and little Bob, and Teresa, and, you know, on, on a win. <laughs> I just thought, if I don't pray for them, they're going to die. <laughs> so God answers our prayers. Even if you just mention somebody in prayer, you got to do something for them. Yes. Paul said that. He says, I make mention you of you in my prayer. So just a little prayer, but the pressing in thing, that pressing like Hannah did, like Samuel did, like Daniel did, like Ezra did, like Moses did, like Joseph, Joshua, Joshua, when he hung out in the temple after Moses left, Joshua hung out in the temple. Why would a young kid, he's probably, I don't know, let's say he's 18, okay? Because he couldn't be over 20, otherwise he died out there. <laughs> anyway, he hangs out in the temple. No, no, that's right. He's one spy, sorry. Anyway, he's hanging out in the temple. He says the young man, Joseph, hung out in the temple when Moses went home. He stayed in the temple. Why? Because the presence of God is so fun and so real, and so powerful, and so good, it's fun to hang out in the presence of God. Once you pass the threshold. Once you get past that threshold of, this is, I can't go, Jesus, help me, God. You know, <laughs> I just thank God that I can talk in tongues. Can I, I can't imagine talking in English. I, I do all right here sometimes, but I'll tell you what, I talk about 10 minutes in the presence of God, and that's it. That's all I got. All right, Lord, I don't know anything else. What do you want me to do now? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> I can do that for a half an hour. Yeah, and I have. Yeah. But I just thank God that that's a gift he's given, and, it's, and it makes it so much easier. It does. Just a lot more fun that way. 
And I want you to go to Hebrews 11 just for a minute. Then we're going to go in a different direction. Hebrews 11. I love Hebrews 11. Woo! Hebrews 11. The faith chapter. Yes. Woo! Hallelujah. Almost started talking in tongues just like that. Led by the Holy Spirit, of course. Of course. <laughs> Listen to this. Ah, uh, might as well go up to uh... one. No, <laughs> you like that chapter. Let's go up to thirty. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. It takes as much faith to walk around for seven days as it does to shout and drop the walls. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies in peace. Should have been killed, she should have. And what more shall I say? The time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, etc., etc. Hallelujah. Listen to me close. You are no different than those people. They were just people. God showed us this week as we were over there praying over the high school this week. And I was I was praying over the field, the, the baseball field and the, and the football field. And God showed me a little kid like this. He's got a glove on his left hand because I'm right-handed, right? Okay, he's got a glove like this. And he's thinking, if they hit that ball to me, I wonder if I'm going to be able to catch that ball. And if I don't catch that ball, how's everybody going to feel about me? And I'm going to feel real bad about myself? Can I really run? I think my knees are getting weak. See, that kid is in his own little world. Every person you see, every kid you see is in their own little world. They have their own little world. And God can infiltrate and, and get into that world and touch their hearts as we pray for them. Amen. How do I know this? I got saved. My mom prayed for me. My sisters prayed for me. I got saved. If God can save me, if God can touch me through somebody else's prayer, he can touch and save anybody. Right. Needs to realize it, man. God is moving. God is moving. God is moving. Don't you ever look at somebody and say they're hopeless. They're helpless. Can't be saved. Where did I put my glasses? Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So, so much for prayer, right? Right this second. Um, grace. Yeah. I was thinking about, okay, Luke 7. Luke 7. Let's say the. 20th verse. Man, it's very light back here. You think, you think, oh, my head's in the way. Maybe it's your hat. No, no. I take my hat off, the money will fall out. <laughs> okay. I just, I think of my head sometimes. What does this look like on YouTube? <laughs> okay. It says in the 20th verse, uh, the seventh chapter of Luke. That's Hebrews 11. Remember. Did I say Luke? Yes. yes. Well, what am I doing in Hebrews? Because you were just there. I know. We were just there. We were listening. John the Baptist is in prison. John the Baptist is in prison. He sent his buddies, his disciples over, to ask Jesus if he's the one. Now watch this. In the 20th verse it says, When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? In that very hour, he cured many in infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. And Jesus, are you preacher or am I? <laughs> Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John these things uh, that you have seen and heard. 
The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deep hear, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jump down to 33. It says, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine beaver, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, do you see the difference here? What I was, I wrote this down. It isn't about what's, what should be happening or what we think should be happening or why isn't this happening? Why isn't that happening? It's about what God is actually doing right now at this time. When Billy Graham was here, Billy Graham, you didn't go to Billy Graham's thing to get healed. You didn't go there to get healed. What would you go there to get do? Get saved, absolutely. That's the grace of God that was upon the man and the anointing was to be saved. Now, Oral Roberts, on the other hand, when you went to Oral Roberts, uh, you, healed. you went to get healed. Yeah. Hallelujah. When you went to Captain Coleman's thing, I don't know what you went for there. For. <laughs> yeah. Get the Holy Ghost down there. Or to hear prophecy or things like that. Now, there's, there's a, a guy named Lonnie Frisbee in the first part of the Jesus, Jesus movement in the 68-69. Um, he went and visited Chuck Smith. That's for, actually his daughter drug him over to Chuck Smith's house. These movies that are going on Netflix. Yes. Jesus wow. Yeah. Yeah. So this Lonnie Frisbee is a really, really charismatic guy. Anyway, and here was Chuck Smith. Well, Lonnie Frisbee hung around with Chuck Smith. He did great. A great revival happened. They were they were baptizing hundreds of people a day. Sometimes almost a thousand a day. Their churches filled up, they had a tent and that filled up. They didn't know what to, there was it was great. But Chuck Smith was already a pastor, solid in the Word of God. Lonnie was all on fire for God, and the and the Holy Ghost was doing things, and God was speaking to him and things like that. And he got kind of cocky. He got a little goofy. And everybody knew it, kind of. And Chuck Smith, as long as he hung around with... See, see what did he say over here? He says, uh, uh, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, lepers are cleansed, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. See, we need the word, the gospel preached to them, and we need the moving of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth prophesied some, I don't know, 100 years ago. He says the next move of God, the next great revival of God is going to be the word and the spirit. What God is doing right now in different places all over the earth. He's causing a revival to come forth that not only gets people saved, but healed and delivered and set free by the power of God. So let's not hinder the Lord as we see Him working. Whether He, whether, but you got to ask God, what it, what are you doing right now in this place? Right now, what are you doing, Holy Spirit? What are you doing right now? Because I got to know whether you're going to heal, whether you're going to deliver, or are you just going to save? Should I give him a glass of water in the name of the Lord? Should I beat him over the head with his Bible? What should I do? That's right. Okay? We need to know that. We get to thinking, remember Vineyard, the Vineyard? Yeah. Lonnie Smith went to the Vineyard after that, and he kind of he got the movement going when they laid hands on people and he got them slayed out in the Holy Ghost. John Wimber went, hook, line, and sinker was great. Now, I learned a lot from John. Awesome things. Learned how to get people healed and stuff like that. But then you had Calvary Chapel which wasn't going for that kind of stuff. But the, the two of them yes. are buddies. The two of them are friends, and they have covenant together to show one another what God is doing. Come on. Hallelujah. Some people don't want the move of God. Just don't want it. Too much hassle. Too much. If you ever watch that little movie, I only watched like 20 minutes of it. If you ever watch it, some of the people just got up and left. They didn't like this guy. The hippies. <laughs> you know, they got bare feet. His, his wife goes, he doesn't have any shoes on. <laughs> Jack says, don't worry, we'll get him a pair of shoes later. <laughs> praise the Lord. So, oh, praise the Lord. It was it, between. Remember and Luke, okay, let's go to. Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord. Remember, I just read, you know, uh, Jesus came eating and drinking. John the Baptist came doing neither. So it isn't about eating or drinking or lots of wine or no wine. 
or a bunch of food or no food. It's not about that. It's, it's about what God is doing now. In uh, Luke 8, in 35, it says that, uh, what does it say? Then they went out to see what happened and came to Jesus and found a man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Here Jesus had got this guy delivered from a demon. That's one of the things the children of God do, by the way. So if God gets you face to face with a demon, deal with the sucker. Don't get weirded out. Don't, don't, like that. You don't have to do what the demon is doing. Just take authority over it in Jesus' name. Now watch this. And jump down here to the 39th verse. It says, uh, 38, it says, Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return to your own house and tell the great things God has done for you. Listen to this. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city the great things that Jesus had done for him. Here we have a missionary that's about uh, 10 hours old in the Lord, and God sends him on the mission field. He didn't go to Bible school. He didn't go to anything. He just had what God had done for him. You people in this place, you must have something that God has done for you. So go tell that story. That's a good story. Nothing wrong with stories. Praise the Lord. So, here we have him casting out. Return to your old house. Okay. By the way, he said, return, and he returned to it. He says, return to your own house. The guy had a house. He had a life before he was demon possessed. I never saw that before. This guy had a life before he was out in the graveyard cutting himself and screaming and going on like that. Before he was demon possessed. After he was demon possessed, he also had a life. And I bet you dollars to donuts, he got into the Word and found out what it, what it was like and found out how to walk with God. Woo, hallelujah. You can only go on the thing for so long. <laughs> Jesus on his way to heal. heal. Anyway, Jesus on his way to heal uh, Jairus' daughter, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, comes, he heals her. Uh, then the woman comes into the banquet that the Pharisees throw for Jesus. The woman comes in, alabaster box of fragrant oil, breaks it at his feet, puts it all, it fills the house, and the, and the guy starts saying, well, if this guy was a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman was touching him. Do you notice that? We just read back here in 70, he says, he's a, he's a, you know, he likes wine and he likes to eat and he, and he likes sinners and tax collectors. It's true. Oh my God, it's true. Jesus likes sinners. He hung out with them. Oh Lord, have mercy. I don't know what to do with these guys. Praise the Lord. So, whether it's healing a woman with the issue of blood, uh, saying to a woman, your sins are forgiven you, whether it's raising the dead or casting out demons in the Gennesaret, or whatever it is, it's all about what God is doing right now in you. Hallelujah. Remember when the, the disciples were on the boat? Started sinking. Jesus is sleeping in the bow. And they wake him up. What do they say to him? Don't you care? It's like the other guy that asked him, if you, if you can do anything. It's, They've seen him do everything. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse lepers. They've seen him do all this stuff. And what do they say at the end? Who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him? See, no matter how much we get to know Jesus, there's more to know. That's right. No matter how much you know about him, there's more to know. He is so exciting. He's the best that ever was. Ah, praise the Lord. Everybody that came to came to Jesus, didn't come to get healed. Most of them came to hear him. You see that? Here we have the Spirit, and we have the Word. Most people that came to Christ wanted to hear him. Even the soldiers that came to arrest him, they went back to the Pharisees and said, and the Pharisees go, well, where is he? He says, no man spoke like that man. They didn't arrest him because of what he was saying. Do you get it? Your life 
doesn't only need to show what you're doing, but what you're saying is important. Yes. This, this I'm absolutely convinced of. They came to hear him. Speak the truth, whether it fills a room or empties it. I got that out of the book. Isn't that good? Speak the truth, whether it fills the room or empties the room. Speak the truth, but speak it in love. Speak the truth in love, but speak the word. Speak the truth. I know that these kids out there that we were praying for, and that's the revelation that uh, Wes got, these kids are hungry for truth. Yeah, that's right. They are hungry for truth. They're just like every other kid that ever was raised. They, at a certain age, are hungry for truth. They want to know what's true. Right. Here we have what, a fourth grade teacher, right? This year, yeah. This year, fourth grade. <laughs> Routine, uh, or whatever your name is, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> My sister, fourth grade teacher. These kids are hungry for truth. And the more we pray for them, that hunger's going to grow. And once they hear it, not just see it, please hear me. Once they hear the truth, they, it will resound in their hearts. It will resonate inside of them. And it'll come. You know, it just, just like, a, like the guitar. You, you hear the bass this morning? Was that cool? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. No man spoke like this man. No man spoke like this man. Oh, yeah. And, as far as prayer goes, we are not going against people when we go against evil. That's why we pray. We're dealing with spiritual things, not with physical things. There are things to do in the physical, don't get me wrong. Okay? But the first thing you do, you can do more than pray after you pray, but before you pray, you can't do anything. Yeah. It's true. Yes. Listen to this. I got this this morning. People have free will. We cannot control that. Do you hear me? Yes. People have choice. They have free will. We can't control that. But the forces behind the evil, we see, and what is driving the anger and the depression and the hopelessness in these people, we can do something about. Oh. Yes. I don't know about you, that just Amen. turned me off. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. I can do something about the evil in the world. Right. Not so much in the physical, but boy, I tell you what, in the spirit you can do. Why did Zechariah, what, 4, four 6 says, It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Yes. It says in Ezekiel uh, 9 11, it says, this, The race is not to the swift, nor the fight to the strong. But I don't know what else it says. Can't remember. So we looked that up. <laughs> uh, Ecclesiastes 911. 911. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what does that say? I gotta read it. Sorry. I haven't done much this year. 9-11. It says right here. I returned and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Bad things actually happen to good people. Yep. Yes. Good things happen to bad people. Yep. Hear it. It's important. Otherwise, we'll start thinking, well, why is this happening to me? <coughs> because time and chance happen to everybody. Everybody. It's how we respond to what's going on in our lives that really counts. Hallelujah. And what you speak over those things. You have power in your speech. Praise the Lord. You have power in what you say. Yes. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. No. But against principalities and powers. Rulers of wickedness in high places. Woo! Lord of God. And we, we're just a motley crew, right? Yeah. Remember last week I talked about Gideon? You know, the army they were going against was like 135,000. 135,000. Here, God chose an insignificant and outnumbered band of Jews to whoop them. That <laughs> just turned me on. Okay, 1 Corinthians 1. You're going to like it. You've known it forever. It's not like I'm preaching to a bunch of uh, people who don't know anything. I mean, we got Bible teachers in here that, ooh. I went to my sister's Bible study one time. I thought, sorry, Tracy. 
I just went to make her feel better. Because <laughs> I thought there was enough people there, so I went to make her feel better. <laughs> That's hilarious, I did. But when I got there, she had this like board and all this stuff, and she started writing on the board, and I'm, I'm going, Oh, that. that word means that. Man, I went back and I went back and it was Chris, one of the best Bible studies I've ever been to. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then she went and taught fourth grade at that. You know, that thing's okay. First Corinthians 1. You have to use that on them. First Corinthians 1. First Corinthians, the first chapter. We we'll start there in the 26th verse. You know this verse. Okay, we just talked about the 300 Hebrews going against 135,000 demon-possessed terrorists. These were like ISIS kind of people. These were mean, nasty people, been trained to kill. They had no mercy. They had no quarter. They just killed people, right? And here we have 300 going against these guys. What do you think? No wonder you told the 22,000 to go home. They were scared. I wonder if these guys, these 300... Weren't really scared, but they were scared, but they just didn't want anybody to think they were. <laughs> that's usually how it works. Yeah, it's usually how it works. That's whoops. That's where heroes come from. It's not the guys that aren't scared. It's the guys that press through that fair and be heroes anyway. Courage, hallelujah. Yeah. Just to add a caveat to that: for every hundred people that are on the battlefield, ninety of them never should have been there in the first place. Only <laughs> ten of them are actual warriors, but only one is going to control the flow of battle. Yeah, but that's that's it. That's it. You throw, it's like the last starfighter. You know? <laughs> yeah? the, guy, the, the Greek, the lizard guy, gets him in a battle and he starts shooting. He says, he says you could have got me killed. He says, I thought if I threw you into the midst of the battle, maybe a real starfighter would come forth. Oh, but maybe there was none there to begin with. Oh, no. The guy turns around and he goes, Greg, there's a starfighter left. <laughs> oh, man. Get him, I'm not going to get him. Praise the Lord. All right. So, in 1 Corinthians 20, the first chapter, 26 verse says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things that are despised, God has chosen. And the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Hallelujah. That's why God dwindled down Gideon's army. Why? Because that no flesh should glory in his presence. Too many guys, they would have thought they won it on their own. <clears throat> they knew, as a matter of fact, they could not whip 135,000 people with 300 guys. It's either God or nothing. But right. you notice they went. They went and did the thing. But I don't know about you, I might have broke the pitcher, but blow the trumpet for crying out loud. They're not done one right where I am. They'll come up here. Maybe you don't think like that. I think. Okay, okay, this is good. In Revelation, no, that's not. Oh, the, this, the, what we are experiencing and beginning to experience is the outpouring of the latter rain. The latter rain started in, in Pentecost, in chapter 2, the former rain. Now we're beginning to experience the latter rain. The former and the latter rain together. Okay? So, it's, it prophesies this in Hosea 6.3, in Joel 2.23, mm -hmm. and Zechariah 10.1. It prophesies the latter rain. In fact, in Joel, the second chapter, I'm just going to read it real fast. You guys know already? Mm -hmm. Hosea, Joel, Joel 2.23. It says this. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down on you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. 
Hallelujah. Amen. I kind of get excited about this whole revival thing because of it. Yeah. Okay. In, in John, the fifth chapter says, we know we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. As righteousness and power and truth increase, so will wickedness. Yes. Sorry, it's what the Bible says. It's, it's, yeah. look, at, look at the world. You think it's just Holy Ghost people all over? I mean, yeah, there are, some, there are some evil things going on in the world. Yeah. But it said way back then, he says, we know we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. Under the control of, okay? Now, in Revelation 3.17, it says about the church mm -hmm. that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. <laughs> I, just, I just like to go there. Revelation, the third chapter. Did that depress you? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it says here, in the 15th verse, it says, I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. Then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Ooh. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments so you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may be not be revealed and you anoint your eyes with the eye salve that, that, that you may see as many but, but as many as I love I rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent listen to this I use this on sinners all the time but this is not for sinners the 20th verse in the 3rd chapter is for behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and dine with him he with me. And then it talks about overcomers. That's talking to the church, not talking about a bunch of sinners. Isn't that amazing? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. God, in this day and age, is doing something in the church and he's waking us up. Yes, that's right. He's waking us up. How do I know that? Things are getting hairy, y'all. Either wake up yes. or die. That's right. Or freak out or go crazy or whatever you want to do. But I'd rather wake up. <laughs> and I'm just starting to wake up. I'm just starting. It's just starting inside of me. Something inside of me goes, Ooh. okay. Remember when you, anybody a pilot? When you fly, you have to have those personal minimums. Personal minimums: the weather, the wind, what I'm thinking. You know, I wrote down here how humble I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two buddies of mine died because they weren't humble. Flying hang gliders. One guy fell and he bent his apron, straightened his apron out and went and flew again. He's doing outside loops. Apron down, he went, crashed. I was talking to a guy on a hill. And the wind started coming a different way. It's coming up over this hill. And, was, and I could tell it was twirling like this. And I told the guy. And I started taking my kite down. He says, he says what are you doing? I said, well, if you go down there, that wind's going to come over the hill. It's going to knock you right into those trees. Mm -hmm. I've been flying for 15 years. I do not need anybody to tell me what I'm doing. <laughs> and so what did he do? He took off. He flew out there. We come over there. Knocked him. Knocked him in those trees. Fell down. Yep. An idiot. You know, all you have to do is be a little humble. So there are personal minimums that we need in our lives. Right? Okay, we can't control the wind, we can't control the seasons, but we can live, think, and act in those seasons that God has brought into our life. Frodo, actually, Gandalf t told Frodo, Frodo was talking, he said, I wish it need not happen in my time, Frodo said. And Gandalf said, so do I. And he said, and so do all... Do all who live in so, so do all who live in such a time, okay? But that is not for us to decide. All we have to decide is what we do at the time that is given to us. Were you guys there at the at the book? Yeah. Okay, Tolkien's book, The Lord of the Rings. Anyway, 
You remember the movie then? Okay. Okay. So, so he said, he says, I wish this wasn't happening in my time. Who here doesn't wish, wish this was not happening in my time? I wish it was back, you know, 50 years ago when people weren't so, anyway, when the world wasn't so crazy. But all we have to do is decide what we're going to do while we're in the season we're in. Yes. Right. Praise the Lord. It's so, it's so wonderful to be alive today. Amen. It's just wonderful to be alive today. And in first, Second Peter 3.11, it says, Seeing how we know that these things are going to happen, that the earth is going to burn and things like that, he says, what manner of men ought we to be? What manner of people ought we to be in righteousness and true holiness? What manner of people ought we to be? He's like Frodo, you know. I wish it wouldn't happen in my time, but I hope I, I hope I do okay. It's our watch, but you know, we can blame, we can blame, all of these people, you know, on what's going on in the world. I'm sorry, it ain't the people's fault. It's on our watch. Amen. We let all this come in. Yeah, we allowed it on our watch. Yes. My watch. I allowed it in. I didn't stand up. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. No. Nope. Farting around in my own, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read this to you. What, what, day, what day is this in the year? What day are we in? What number? Oh, God. In the 365 days this year, what number are we on? I found this on the web. Okay. Oh, well, yeah, I, I know there's 360. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to read this one thing to you, but it, it, 218. <laughs> I looked, I figured it out this morning, but I just forgot. I think it was 17. I figured it out as 2017. Okay. <clears throat> Listen to this. It says, Gladys Allward was a missionary to China in the early 1900s. He was forced, forced to flee when the Japanese invaded Yangqing. The area where she lived, however, she was determined not to be the only one to make it to safety, so only one with only one assistant, she led more than 100 orphans over the mountain toward what that time was free China. In the book, The Hidden Price of Greatness, authors Ray Besson and the Share the Count. Okay. Hey. <laughs> During Gladys's harrowing journey out of war-torn main chain, she grappled with despair as never before. After passing a sleepless night, she faced the morning with no hope of reaching safety. A 13-year-old girl in the group reminded her of her much-loved story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. But I am not Moses, Gladys cried in desperation. Of course you aren't, the girl said, but Jehovah is still God. <laughs> then Gladys and the or orphans made it through and proved once again that no matter how inadequate we feel, God is still God. You can still trust him. Amen. Isn't that good? So no matter what is happening, and then it, it says this, uh, uh, when we face conflict and difficult times and wonder, will God be with me? Will he abandon us? The writer of Hebrews offers us a five negative promise that is a positive. And it's the scripture that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Listen to this. I will never... Positively not. It will never happen. It's unthinkable. There's not even the slightest possibility that it will ever happen. God will be with you. Amen. Never, 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 never. And I'll leave you with what uh, uh, Churchill said to, to the people. when He said to his alma mater, he stood up, and this is the speech he gave. Never give up. Never, 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 never give up. And he sat down. I'm telling you, man. 
That's where we're at. We give up or we fight. And we fight on our knees most of the time. So praise the Lord. I love you guys. Oh. They will be baptizing at the pool at four if anybody wants to get baptized yes. today. So Father, we thank you for allowing us this. We love to give, Lord, so give as, as hilarious people. In Jesus' name. Amen. What's the hand? Where's the band? I don't know. Somebody has a bigger hand. in your hand. Now we're going we're gonna to receive communion. Let's think about this for a second. He says, this is the bo my body that's broken for you. So we're going to think about the body of Christ. His body that was broken for us. Yes. Now it says, by his stripes you are healed. Okay? So we're thinking about stuff over here, Judy. <laughs> She can't hear me. Pardon me. Oh, she did hear that. That's good. So, Lord, we're really thankful that we get to, uh, I mean it, God. Your body was broken for us. And by your stripes, we are healed. So we think about that this morning, Lord, that your, your, your stripes were taken for us, our healing. And this is the meal that heals, for sure. But also, Lord, we think about, um, about the body of Christ. We consider the body of Christ around us, Lord. And what we, what, before we speak, Lord, we think, is, is it true, is it helpful, inspiring, necessary, or kind? 
So Lord, as we think about these things, if there's if there's anything we have any uh, against anybody, right now we forgive them. It doesn't take a long time here. We just forgive them. Yes. We speak forgiveness to them. I forgive you. Go free from my heart right now. Go free. Jesus forgives you. His blood was enough. So we thank you for your body that was broken for us. Amen. And Lord, it's obvious what your blood has done. Washed our sins away. Oh. Your grace, your grace, Lord, is bigger than all our sin. Your blood is efficient and sufficient to cleanse all our sins away. So we turn our back on our sin right now, Lord, and we ask you to come and forgive us of our sins, Lord. Forgive our sins. Yes. Forgive our sins, Lord. That's right, even that one, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Wash us clean right now. As we partake of this, Lord, we understand what we're doing. We remember your death until you come. Amen. every time. He's choking the wine. Stop choking the bread. That's a lot. That was, that was interesting. Wani Frisbee, when he took communion at the church on one time, he turned to his partner and says, I don't think that's what you want. Okay. Get people that never come to church before. Tell them it's Wani. They think you're lying. So this evening, I don't, I don't imagine we're going to have church tonight, but we are going to go at four o'clock. We're going to have a baptizing down at the pool. Yeah. Hallelujah! If you haven't been baptized, please come down there just a little bit early, and we'll talk to you a little bit. Wear your, wear your shorts, or whatever you want to wear. I don't care. But, but if you want to get baptized, we will baptize you tonight. We will do that tonight. I remember when Peggy got baptized, we had to break ice on the canal to get her up. Yeah. Then she banged her head on the bridge. Blood running down her face. I said, you want to get out? She says, there ain't nothing going to stop me from being baptized. Atlanta's kid got baptized and snow it is snowing when yeah, we're down the river. Yeah, praise the Lord. So we're just picking the pool this time. We're not. Oh no, no, I, I know. But <laughs> one of the reasons, because some people just can't get down to the river. Right, right. So we're going down to the pool. Down to the pool. Okay. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. See you at four. Four. Baptism at four. Amen.